Uh, so welcome to this meetup uh, about the uh, event-driven enterprise, uh, where we'll discuss uh, about uh, microservices and uh, real-time analytics. Um, Marc Delbar, CEO of Digazoo, and uh, Frédéric Jean-Nobien, solution architect of Axonic. Uh, and they will present you a bit uh, the journey uh, towards uh, the future of event-driven enterprise. So I was about to do a joke. As we all speak in French, we will do it in English. But there is uh, someone speaking in English, so we, there is no point anymore. So. And we, 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 we heard the choreography here. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. See, look, it's very nice. Huh? <laughs> That's been the, 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 the biggest part of our preparation. So no surprise, we will talk about even driven enterprise. Otherwise, uh, we, we missed a lot. So, but uh, other people, other wait, cool. We cannot speak about enterprise, even driven enterprise, without speaking the 90s legacy, which I call, like in the music, it's the dark age of computer science. That's my personal perspective. You can say it's not true. But what is it, basically? You recognize the picture is ugly. It's, on, it's the purpose to be ugly, because it's ugly and it's sad. You recognize the monolith. When I started uh, 13 years ago, so it's not that long, uh, I started in the banks and I started like completely distributed, uh, function as a service, um, secure RS already, even sourcing already. So I started with this. We didn't have the words because it was 13 years ago. And then I had to, a few years ago, to go into this. And I became sad. At one point in my life, I wanted to just grow tomatoes and say, I will just stop computer science. So you understand this, right? And then at one point, one guy said, it's not good. So one monolith is not enough. We'll do multiple monoliths, and we will make the monoliths talk to each other in a synchronous way. Still, nobody understands Stone Edge. It's the same. Nobody understands the distributed monolith. Same thing. They said, we will distribute everything, one domain, one database, one service, then we have a full mesh of communication. When one is broken, everything is broken, it's cool. We don't understand. What is wrong? Except the fact that the distributed monolith is, uh, is something that nobody will understand. The problem is the data is represented as a snapshot. Imagine, I always take, I come from the banks, so I will always take the, the bank account and cards and customers. Imagine we have this database and account service and we store just the balance of your account. Cool, I can, uh, I can go to the store and say, I want to purchase. Right, do I have enough money? Yes, no, cool. But then the three years after, after we did like six billion of transaction, Analytics comes and say, yeah, it's cool, but can you tell me for the five past years, what were the income for everyone <laughs> or the expense for everyone? Uh, actually, no, <laughs> we can't. Okay, so what is missing? Please, let's make it... Aha. What? <laughs> Thank you, Charles. <laughs> but I would say no. The events. Yes, yes. So, okay, we'll speak about events, otherwise there is a problem in the presentation. But I will speak about I 90s and still not today's architecture. You will understand why. So I will speak about events. And why? Because the business, when they talk to each other, when they talk with business people, they will always say, uh, when we do something, that happened. When that happened, we need to do something. And then we need to do something. So events are a natural way of speaking amongst the business people. So when we aggregate, when we define events, it's, it should be business terms, right? And then they will start to understand. If you say CRUD, they will say create, update, delete. I don't know what it is, but Okay, I believe you. So let's speak about events. So what are events? Events are just facts, something that happened in the system, so something that was modified, okay? 
you have an example here. You have account opened, amount deposited, amount withdrawn, account closed. You can find a lot. But it's cool to have this, and don't believe it's a table. Yes, it's a table, but don't think it's a table for now. If I have this, this history, or just a stream, I can define or project and have the balance. <coughs> easy. I have amount deposited, withdrawn, plus, minus. It's easy to do the balance, right? A pound, uh, a, a opened is zero, then plus, minus. We can do arithmetics. But then it's, it becomes easier to do the, the other dashboards. Incomes, expense, balances, is my, uh, I don't know, my company viable? We can also create uh, a dashboard for this. And then we have, as we say, someone like this said, they will be haters, always. And people said, comes to me and say, ah, oh, don't speak about event, we tried, we failed. I love this kind of conversation because it's always the same problem. I say, show me your model. And they have this. We have account created, account deleted, updated, and that's it. I say, cool. And where is the plus? The plus is in the updated, probably. Ah, and the uh, closed, probably the deleted. Okay, and blocked? Ah, blocked. I don't know. <laughs> so I say, okay, your model is shit. I don't understand. If you take someone from the business and say, do you understand this? Is it? I don't know. I don't know what it is. But this? Ah, yes, I know. So that's the problem. Your model should be precise. Keep that in mind. So, of course, if it was not today architecture, now I'll speak about today architecture. And, in to and today, events were just the beginning. We are talking about Today, for really advanced and mature architecture, we speak about secure as event sourcing and process management, and then analytics. And Mark will talk about this with, with fears. <laughs> but let's start with something very important, and you will understand why we do all these kinds of patterns, because it's not for fun. When I was in the bank, uh, I didn't know what was secure as, I didn't know what was event sourcing. But I know that uh, if we were dropping an operation, <laughs> we will be in the middle like whoosh, something is wrong, right? The system is not correct. So we should be responsive in any time. If we have a card into the terminal, if something goes wrong, we should see it immediately. The guy shouldn't wait like and wait and see the, I don't know, we boop, I don't know if it was okay or not. So no. The, the system we are trying to build should be responsive. Like in the, in the seconds, it's okay, it's not okay. And to be responsive, we need to be resilient. Does that mean you, if one software or piece of software or domain crashes, the others are not impacted? So now we understand why I hate the Stone Edge thing, because if one is impacted, Everybody is calling this one in the full mesh, then the whole system is impacted. So it doesn't make sense. Resiliency is like, okay, something is crashing, you contain it, you remove it, spawn it again, now it's, it's working. Elastic is bound to resilient because if you want to be resilient, you need to actually contain, drop it, start it again. So that means elastic because you need to come and go. That's the elastic part. I don't like this, this uh, wheel because you don't see that actually to be resilient and elastic you need to be message driven and asynchronous message driven communication based. That's the manifesto. I'm not that clever to define the why. I understand why of course but a lot of people much smarter than me they created the manifesto and say we need to have asynchronous communication with message base and message is not only events okay that's why we we tend to do secure as secure as command query responsibility segregation normally everything should be understood from the name but I will explain really quickly because we don't have so much time 
The ID, if I try to summarize in two minutes, is don't try to optimize read and write operation on the same big database, Oracle database, whatever. It's not possible. Of course, if you have 10,000 rows, don't tell me, please, don't, after the beers, like, yeah, I manage, I have 10,000 rows and it works fine. Yeah, I'm talking about 10 billions row, okay? That's, that's the, the level of uh, complexity. So instead of doing this, do different models really specialized and tailor-made for performance, writing, reading. It's not only one read, because we have multiple use cases for the read. You have analytics projections, you have full-text search, you have just document driven by, by index. So there are multiple read models, but only one write model. Don't, you can interact Anybody can interact if you want. But of course we have multiple models, so what do we do to, to do the synchronization? We, we use the, the events. So that's where event-driven is important. But not only. So the events are used actually when something happened in the right model, an event is created. Please forget about the CRUD event. You understood why it was bad, so something really business-oriented like account opened, closed, blocked amount, withdrawn, whatever, but business oriented. Use commands for writing. The commands arrive in the system. What do you want with the, to do with the command? You want to validate the command. If it was okay, you create an event. If it was not okay, you say, sorry, but the command is not, is not good. You want to, to purchase something, you don't have enough money. <laughs> sorry, pal, come back uh, next month <laughs> with chance. But Securus is saying that the right model is still a snapshot somewhere in the database. Okay, so, and something that nobody understands is that that snapshot is not the full model of the aggregate. It's just a validation model. So for a customer, if you don't want to validate anything about its address, don't put the address into the aggregate. Okay, that sounds crazy, but you want to keep the fields, you want to validate. If you don't want to validate the address, don't keep the field. So the aggregate can be very small, but still a snapshot. A snapshot is bad, you will say, because I'm, I'm speaking about events, but you will see later. Use queries for reading. That makes sense. I hope I don't have to, to understand, to, to explain that. But the queries are actually executed on read models. Makes sense. Read models, queries. So to do that, what kind of components do we need? And please don't speak about technology for now, just components. We need a command bus, query bus, event bus. We throw commands to the system, we throw queries, we throw events, so it's quite easy for now, right? But why we do this? If we have CTOs, CXOs, why we use buses and not HTTP interfaces? Because we don't want to know if I want to throw a command to the system, we don't want to know where is the system, who is the system. I don't care. I just want to throw a command. Do that, do that, please. Okay, so that's the location transparency. If you are doing something and it switched from Europe to, to I can say UK now. <laughs> I was about to say US. Why not UK, just for fun? You don't care. It was switched, but because of the location transparency, it's somewhere else. And I don't care about service locator or things like that. Where is my HTTP? I don't care. I just wanted to throw a message. And if we do this, we are resilient by the reactive manifesto because we are using asynchronous communication. Then, if we want to complete the picture for CQRS, you have the process manager, and the process manager, as I said a few minutes ago, he doesn't want to know where is the command, where is the query. So it's very important to have the location transparency for the process manager to do the policy. Something happened, then something happened, we want to do something. Like some, an event happened, then I have to, to do a command that will create an event, then I come back in my process and I want to do more. You see the chain? So location transparency is very important. That was secure us in a nutshell, very quick. Don't, don't be shy to say it's too slow. <laughs>
or too fast. So I will try to explain even sourcing really quickly. Event sourcing says, instead of just stream your events, don't lose them, store them for infinity. So please use big disk, a joke. Your right model, I said it was a snapshot. It's bad, it's a snapshot, right? So it's like <coughs> snapshot. But instead of having a snapshot, just write the events in a database. So that means the schema is always the same. You can normalize a schema to write events. You can change it for years, say, I would like this and this and that, but you can normalize the, the, the schema. If you write this into a database, you can actually reuse that history to rehydrate a validation model in memory. So you can, by code, change your validation model. So it makes your validation model super easy to change. This is not linked to a database. This is not linked to a database model. It's linked to code. Easier, right? I hope there is no DBAs, because they will say, oh, DB is the most important. <laughs> OK, no DBA, cool. <laughs> so the event sourcing is, your right model is just the history of events. Then you will say, yeah, but if the history is too big, how do you optimize? We use Snapshot for that. If you want to have more information, Bar, Beers, me, Anthony, we can discuss about this. We still use the events to synchronize the projection and nothing change. But nothing change, why we store them? Imagine we have still the same history here. We can reproject the balance. Yeah, sure. But imagine you are, after two years, people from BI, they always come like six months after and say, cool, but now we, we want this uh, dashboard with all the information that you stored six months ago. If you don't store them, you'll <coughs> damn. Uh, okay, we'll do migration things. Or you will use a very smart tool that Digazoo <laughs> created. But if you don't have Digazoo, you're basically screwed. So, no, now you store them. So you can actually say, okay, from, I start from scratch. I say, I don't have that dashboard now, but I create a code that says, I will aggregate those events and reproject them into that table, into that specific database technology. For instance, this, this projection, like income, expense, and is it safe? Do I expense more than I earn? That was the safe. Or you can say, very bad ID, but, oh no, I, I will put the balance and the income and the expense and the save because they want to do that. And say, shit, because now I want to also see the balance completely isolated from the expense and from the report, but actually I store everything. So I can go back, <laughs> then I will go back to this. You can destroy everything, change the code, reproject from zero, it will take days, but you can change because you store everything. So that's cool, you just change code, you don't change database, you just drop the database. Start from scratch, drop the database. So that's nice. So what we add as a component for this, we need the event store now. And the event store becomes the central piece. If you have an event store, you can use it as an event bus. If you have an event bus, you cannot use it as an event store, right? It's the Kafka problem. I will not talk about this. But what ES is uh, even sourcing, is bringing to, to you is extensibility. You can create new dashboards, you can, you can validate a different way with code. That's cool. Why am I here? You see, I'm Axonic. Axonic, we are specialized in CQRS and even sourcing. We have multiple products, multiple solutions. Uh, I will speak about only three. I put this one just <laughs> for, to say we have another one. Uh, so we have the framework. What the framework is doing, uh, it's really focusing on the Java ecosystem. I shouldn't say JVM anymore because we are, we are compliant with GalVM now, we can do binaries. But it provides the, the way to create DDD, play with aggregates and all the, the stuff, DDD. I will not speak about DDD in that details, again, beers, bar. But it will provide abstract components, all the components I describe. Common bus, query bus, even bus, even store. And it play really well with Kotlin. I will speak about Kotlin 
only. <laughs> the server is actually the implementation in one magic box that plays very well with the framework. So it implements all the components, and especially the store. And the synapse is to, like I said, jailbreak yourself. If it's not, it's to go out of the Java ecosystem. You could use any language now. It's just the HTTP interface on top of the, of the server. That's it. The high-level architecture, so we tend to have stereotypes of services for UX and for business. The UX are interface, so it's actually just providing gRPC, HTTP, any interface you want to, to create in your system. The read models, projection in a database, full text search, whatever, th those are different services, those are different containers, if I speak in technology. I don't like to speak in technology, but for you to understand. This is for me the UX part. Of course, projection and <laughs> Mac will just, what, you say read models, UX? No, 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 it's business as well. Of course, it's business. You have business insights from your projection as well. So it's also part of the business. But the business is also, and mainly, sorry, <laughs> write models and processes. And those are also different deliverables, different services. And in the middle, you have Axon Server, Axon Synapse, to make it communicate in a small ecosystem. Then you have other technologies to communicate across ecosystems. And now, the best part. <laughs> Thank you. So I come so, to this yeah, side, when well, you were sitting between me and my beer, which was a, a, a big issue. <laughs> Where is my beer? Bad design. Where is my beer? Let me take a sip here. Very important for the transition, you know. Now is the time to sip. Mm. Perfect. Now I, I can feel I can feel the taste of events. So, data analytics. Um, so far, we've been talking. Of Frederick has been talking mostly about about uh, operational aspects uh, of businesses and 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 uh, you know all of the flows of more traditional monolithic systems and how you know an event-based approach could could um, could could help. What I'm going to talk about is the analytical part. So basically, how do you generate insight uh, from the data which mostly resides in your operational systems, be that as events or as any kind of other you know format. Uh, that 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 you might use, you know, for your operational systems. So it's basically about trying to get, you know, additional insight for your business to um, to to better do business. First insight is that you know, Frederick has mentioned it. You know, an event-based approach is interesting from a business point of view because events are closer to business thinking. So when you are trying to generate insights, you know, thinking in events is, is certainly an advantage. The first thing is that, you know, except in very, very rare cases, the, the data in operational systems is not organized for analytics, right? So the main purpose of, of, of organizing data in operational systems is to run your business, right? So you run your business, you, do, you open accounts, you close accounts, you do stuff, you know, you talk to customers, you create, uh, you, create uh, you know, new car models and, uh, and uh, you, you check quality and all of these things. But that's basically running your business. If you want to start taking this data to use it for insights, you need to transform it, right? So, um, and, and you need specialized data infrastructure for analytics. So I hope you'll appreciate the gist of, you know, using this particular font uh, for showing, you know, uh, how things used to be, to be done and how things are still, you know, done in, in many cases. So that's typically a, a, a very traditional, I would say, data warehousing approach where you have all of your source systems, you extracting data from, from source systems in some kind of staging area where you do all kinds of transformation, typically run as batches, so the infamous night batch, you know, and, and uh, that you try to, to, to finish before breakfast. Uh, and, and then you basically starting to load your data in structures uh, where the data can be understood from an analytical point of view. So typically a data warehouse, where you have different dimensions uh, which are organized to be able to provide answers like, you know, what has been the evolution of sales over the last few months? You know, am I making more profit than before or not? You know, these kind of questions, which typically, you know, won't be managed anywhere in there, but will have to be 
provided to business people who want to understand what's going on and whether they're doing a good job and whether they could improve, right? So the issues with, with these approaches is that it's batch-based, uh, meaning that effectively, you know, every time you want to make a transformation, you need to initiate a job, run the job, and, you know, get a result, you know, and so on. So all of that takes time. All of that, you know, might result in desynchronizations. Um, it's very rigid in terms of how the, the data is organized. So typically, you're taking data from there. You have a very, very clear view of how you want to structure your data for analytics, which, which are, you know, the, 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 which are the, the designs, the, the models, if you want, of your warehouse and marts. And then you're pushing your, your, your transformed data into these formats. If you need uh, reporting on something which hasn't been catered for in here, basically, you are, uh, you know, in the mud. Um, and, then, um, and then that's pretty much, you know, the, the issues of, of, uh, of traditional systems. So let's say that you are starting from, you know, from uh, an, a, a series of, of operational systems uh, where you have, you know, data in all kinds of, uh, of available systems, ideally in events, you know, but that doesn't happen in every single project. But, you know, we hope we'll get, you know, more projects where we can, you know, consume events because that's cool. We love events. Uh, and so you're then, basically saying that I'm living in a in a fake world. <laughs> no, I'm I'm saying that you know not every that you haven't managed to convince everyone yet. It's true. Uh, although you know I, I must say I'm convinced, uh, but there are still a lot of other data sources than than events. I'm sorry. No, it's true. It's, it's <laughs> that's basically the, true. That's the sad reality. Yeah. The the issue of trying to start from all of these, uh, I would say, heterogeneous data sources and of basically being able to provide input for running, you know, data-driven business use cases. So basically, uh, anything that can provide business insight on, on the right-hand side through business intelligence or through data science. You know, these are the, the main pain points that you have by trying to go from there to there, right? First thing is that, you know, there is an impact on operational systems. So every time that you're trying to run a batch, you know, on an operational system, you're basically putting some pressure uh, on, on that system. The duration of daily batch is quite interesting in, in some insurance companies and, and banks. You know, when, when the daily batch, you know, the, the, the night batch doesn't fit the night, then, then it, you know that you, that you have an issue. Um, latency, so the fact that everything is batch-based means that you basically need to schedule stuff, and then you're losing a lot of time between, you know, the, the data over here and the freshness of the data over there, right? So there is typically a desynchronization between the data as you have it, you know, out of your operations and the data as you would visualize in your reporting uh, environment, right? So you, you're losing uh, this real time, you, 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 you're basically increasing the latency. Um, these are typically these types of, of, uh, of data transformation architectures, you know, are constrained by volumes. Uh, so they're not, they're not built for things like IoT, they're not built for, for things like, you know, high volume, you know, uh, uh, web interactions with customers. So they are okay, you know, when you're dealing with, with limited volumes of data, but you, when you're running with very, very high volumes, uh, they might create, you might create bottlenecks here. And bottlenecks here have two issues. One is that it slows down everything. So if you're putting too much data in there, everything will, will, will slow down, and that won't help on that one, so the batch will be even longer. Or you just don't go for it. Okay, you, you leave your data there, you don't bother because you know, you know that you, it's going to put uh, your, your data uh, infrastructure on, on, on its knees. So you basically leave some data sources, you know, untouched uh, from a reporting and from an analytics point of view. Uh, and then I, I've covered that, the lack of flexibility in data structures. Sometimes you just want, you know, a new angle, a new report, and, and you know, modifying the very static uh, structures of a data warehouse makes it difficult. And I know there are all kinds, you know, I'm, I'm making a big short, because I know there are all kinds of non-event-based approaches, you know, which cater for that, like data lakes and so on, but that's not the point of today's speech, right? So events are, are, are the solution to everything, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. So let me introduce you stream processing. Stream processing is, is, is how you handle um, effectively integration in an event-based way, right? So instead of trying to take, uh, to take you know, parts of data and do all kinds of, of, uh, of batches 
to transform this data and to load it somewhere else. What you do is that you transform everything into events. Right? So everything is an event. That's cool. We love it. We love events. Uh, and, and effectively, the, the whole thing is that instead of having uh, batch-based integration, you have a continuous integration where everything that happens in your source <laughs> systems gets transformed into an event. And this event just accumulate over time and combine with each other and then are pushing inside on the other side. Right? Um, so you ingest events from multiple sources. So ideally, you know, if you already have a source system, you know, something that thinks in terms of events, you just take the event, easy. Uh, if you don't have that, you need to convert between, between the things which happen on your systems to these events, uh, typically using uh, approaches like change data capture, CDC, you know, something has changed, so that's an event, you capture the event, you push it uh, on, on, on your integration layer. Simplifying the picture to the max, uh, you know, to do um, proper stream integration, you need at least two components, you probably need a few more, but these are the two that matter. You know, one is an event broker, you know, where basically your events, you know, get, get captured and, 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 and passed on. And then the second thing you need is stream processing, so the ability to combine events on the flight, you know, as they arrive, right? Um, so typically, uh, that's used for all kinds of processes. For example, if you, have, um, if you have an event which is you have a customer interaction on the web, okay, and on another system, you might have some reference data, you know, that, that you might want to, to combine uh, with this event to create an, an enriched event, for example. That would be an example of a, of a stream processing. You enrich an event with additional, with additional reference data so that you have a, an event which is even more meaningful uh, from a business point of view by, by pulling information from other systems, right? So the idea again is that at the end you'll have events that will pile up. Uh, so all of the benefits that Frederic has mentioned, uh, which is that you can reconstitute the full history. It's easy, it's easy to get back in time, to time travel, to get a picture of what the situation was at any point in time, to see trends, evolutions, and so on, that these are the, the main benefits of, of, of stream processing. So from a, a, a benefits point of view, uh, alerting systems are typically based on, on, on stream processing because, you know, uh, if, if you want to, to be able to, answer, to, to react to an alert quite fast, uh, so if, if your alert is, is basically one day old, you know, like uh, the alarm rings in, in your house, you know, when, when the burglars are gone for, for, for 20 hours, you know, that's not very efficient, right? So, so you want... Uh, to implement alerting systems based on, on low, latent, low, low latency technology, you want to make sure that you're getting the alerts as soon as you can. Uh, real-time dashboards, so if you want to have like a real-time inventory, for example, for, for retailers, if you, have, if you want to have a view of, of all of the you know, current uh, processes which are running, for example, uh, you know, I mean, you, 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 you want, you want to, to, to use real-time dashboards. So typically these are things, sometimes the dashboards, you know, let's say for financial reporting or for tax reasons, you know, once, uh, <laughs> once, once a day or once a week would be good enough. But, but if you want, for example, as a treasurer to manage your intraday cash, you need to have a view of your cash position at any point in time. You know, you, you, you cannot just wait for the end of the day, otherwise you, you're going to make the wrong decisions, right? Um, so, of course, I've talked a lot about business intelligence, but you know, uh, be able to uh, feed uh, or you know models uh, and basically feed recommendation engines based on real-time data allows you to make you know recommendations in real time. Very interesting, of course, every time you are customer-facing, uh, but also very interesting in, in uh, industrial processes, and we'll see an example in, in a second. Um, the technologies I've mentioned, so Kafka, Flink, or, or similar technologies, you know, are built for high volume, low latency. So you can tackle any, any level of, of data you want, and you can basically process the whole data in, in real time. And then uh, I made that up, 24-7 analytics. I thought it, it, it was very cool. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll probably you know, need to call Garner to charge them for the idea. But the, but the whole idea was, was uh, to say, you know, when you have operational systems that need to run 24-7, you basically have no window for your night batch, right? 
because you know the, the systems the, the impact on the systems would be too high if you if you do it in batch so you do the uh, you do the um, the um, the feeding of your analytical systems you know as as things go and the impact you know can can be spread over time on your operational systems so um, at the end, you know, we use something that everyone in data, you know, knows and loves. Uh, but now, now, now I've heard that, you know, it's becoming too hard for people to write SQL, so they, they basically ask bots to write SQL for them. But, you know, <laughs> when, when I started, SQL was easy, you know, but now it's hard, I don't know. Um, there is a difference between stream SQL and, and traditional SQL. The big difference is that, you know, when you do traditional SQL, typically you take Two big data sets uh, as inputs, and then and then uh, or any any number of data sets as input, uh, and then and then uh, and then you generate outputs. Stream SQL is done as you go, right? So it's basically an event is generated. You know, if you need to combine this event with other events, it's looking for all of the events it needs to combine with, waiting for them, and once the things are all there, it it pushes you know a result event. So the advantage is that it's very economical. Uh, so that's batch based and that's incremental. The big advantage of stream SQL is that it's super economical when you have a big part of your data which doesn't change, right? So if you have parts which are static and parts which are dynamic, uh, you're only applying the, 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 the queries on the, uh, on, the, on the transformations, on the changes, and it's much more economical than having to uh, imply your, your full data set. That's an example of what we've done with Digazu. I haven't mentioned Digazu yet. What is Digazu? Uh, before I get into this, this, uh, this case study, Digazu is basically a, a low-code implementation of, of stream technology. So it allows you to use stream integration without knowing anything about the underlying technology. Right? So if you, if you want to feed you know, analytics uh, and use an event-based approach, which I've heard is good, yeah, uh, then- which I know you know it's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then the Gazoo is a is a low is a is a is a low entry point a way of, of 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 getting that done right. So basically, you need no specific knowledge of the underlying you know streaming technologies. You can just with the skill set of a business analyst use SQL transformation and perform all of the miracles that I've shown before. Right. So that's an example from one of our customers, uh, which which I, I, I like a lot, and I like this picture because it's cool. You know, it's basically a futuristic car uh, manufacturing. Uh, what what um, what we've done with this with this customer is that they had um, a notion of a of a of a you know point of failure control, right? A, a process failure sheet, uh, which is basically a, a place where you check that everything is fine, you know, in terms of the production process. And traditionally, they were they were having fixed places in the production chain where these checks were made, right? Uh, what they've done with us is effectively uh, implement a, a, a so-called super cool, it's super cool if you work in car manufacturing, a roaming PFS, you know? It's better, it's better with a British accent, uh, but it's about being able to check, you know, any uh, state of the production chain anywhere at any time, right? So instead of having fixed points where you check quality, you, you can check quality across the whole chain anywhere you, you, you want to look at any point in time. And so it's a big difference because it means that you don't need to wait for the checkpoint to identify quality problems, but you can identify quality problems at any point, uh, at any point in the chain, and you can you know, move your eye like Sauron, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I had to make a geeky, uh, a, a geeky joke, right? Um, so... The benefits of this project were it was a no-code project again, so they, they did that without you know any technical knowledge. Um, at the end, you know they were able you know based on on the amount of cars that were going through the chains and the amount of failures that they were avoiding to save uh, about four hundred you know uh, thousand pounds per year, uh, and and effectively you know the whole the whole project was was effectively quite quite, quite easy to do. But the main thing here was was the ability to use an event-based approach real-time stream technology to check you know, stuff from an analytical point of view at anywhere in the process chain. And that brings us to our final picture. So we need to do this one together. Huh? I mean, well, uh, you do can... we do like a dance? Yeah, so you have the 
operational side where you know magic is happening? Yeah, so uh, I basically explained everything already. And uh, just because I'm a big fan of Golang, I put the gopher here. So basically, you could do your all the stereotypes of services that you want to do, like write model, read models, process, saga, interface in any language that you want. If it's a language, JVM base framework is enough. If it's something else, much better. You need Synapse. But the goal is what? To create a story, right? And to store that story. That's the, that's the thing. That Mark will use. And then, you know, if we have the events, we can just, you know, push them into or event-based, you, know, uh, you know, stream processing integration here and start, you know, uh, pushing that to generate insights, you know, through uh, BI or data science means. Um, in the sad event, you know, where, you know, the customers haven't done their, their work, you know, on the, on the front, we can still, you know, take other sources of data and push them in the same paradigm. So ideally, of course, you want to have a, a full end-to-end event-driven approach. Uh, but the reality is that often it's a mixed, it's a mixed uh, or hybrid uh, situation where a part of the uh, company uh, might have seen the light and a part of it you know, <laughs> might still be you know, sending <laughs> outdated data sources at us. Uh, but from a Degasu point of view, we take it all, transform it all as, as events here. Uh, and you know we do that all, all of that on a, on a low code foundation. So that's so that basically what we do. Unicorn rainbow world, very easy for the Gazoo, but the Gazoo is still still manage the dark side. Yes, of yes. the force. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Voila. So that's uh, I don't know if you have any questions for any of us or if you want to go straight to the bar. <laughs> Maybe we can. Have It's time to burn us alive with a very difficult question.